Hi. Hi, Dr. Vasiliki. Hello, Jason. Uh, How are you? Oh, uh, yeah. Just so thank you for everyone's waiting. And uh, we can, I think we can gonna start at, on time. Okay. Okay, that's very good. That's, that's great. Yeah. Um, first of all, I want to thank you all for attending. And uh, hello uh, to good evening, good morning, good afternoon to everywhere uh, you are in the world and to everyone from Borneo Island, where the FAVA Congress uh, will be taking place, the, um, the, the Asian um, Veterinary Association uh, Congress will be taking place for the next five days. And we will have a workshop with AUHA um, as well. So whoever is attending or is um, uh, wants to register, it will be very, very uh, welcome. The, the lectures will be from the 3rd to 5th of November, and our workshop will be on the 1st of November. Um, and uh, I have to thank AUHA for sponsoring the, uh, the workshop as well. Uh, let's go now to our today's presentation. Have you uh, done any preliminary introduction to what we are going to talk about today, or you just played the, the introductory video? Ah oh, no, I'm just uh just, okay. just make me a host, video. Jason. Yeah. Make me a host so that okay. I can share I can screen. Give you the host. Today we're going to make a very introductory uh session on colonoscopy. We haven't done it so far after um eight to nine. Okay, let me share my screen. Right. webinars. So let's talk about the dirty business of let me share screen. The dirty business of a gastroenterologist. And the one that actually needs the most preparation. I think that you're seeing my screen now, correct? Yes, we can see the screen. Great. Okay, so let's start. Recto, colono, and ileoscopy, because I know that a lot of you who already perform uh, lower uh, GI endoscopy, they do not get into the ileum. And this is very unfortunate because this is your only chance to get biopsies from this part of the small, this segment of the small intestine. Um, and a lot of pathology, especially in cats, um, is defined only in this, constricted in this segment of the of the small intestine, and you might lose it because you might take biopsy from the duodenum um, and lose, and they might come out normal. But in a lot of patients, the problem lies in the ileum, and especially in those patients that you have done your preliminary workup and your B12 is very low, then you will expect to have uh, lesions in the ileum. So we will talk about lower GI, but in this lower GI, it's not going to be only large intestine. We will include also the uh, ileum. Okay. And let's talk about the instrumentation because we're going to start off with the basics to see um, with which scopes we do colonoscopy. Uh, lower GI endoscopy, I prefer to say that uh, better. Um, and it's with the same scope that you're doing your upper GI uh, endoscopy. You don't have to, it would be better to have an exclusive uh, endoscope for lower GI endoscopy uh, because we do not like to put in the stomach the uh, the scope that we have done, that we, we, that we normally put in the intestines, but it's okay if you only have one then you can use your gastroscopes for most of the lower GI procedures in all animals. Uh, even in small breed dogs, you can use your eight millimeter gastroscope. Um, if we had the chance, you know, to if we, if we had the luxury to have one more, then for colonoscopy, we prefer to have um, a diameter, a bit of a bigger diameter, uh, than the gastroscope. So we prefer to have 
I even do sometimes uh, colonoscopies with, with nine millimeters uh, scope. Uh, and the new one is a bigger uh, diameter of AUHA, is a bigger diameter uh, as well. Um, but even bigger diameters, like 11 millimeters colonoscope, the human ones, um, if you have them, uh, then they are fine. Even for medium uh, breed dogs, for small breed, this will give you will be in a bit of a trouble. So we need at least one meter, 1 1.5 would be ideal. Uh, the diameter, nine millimeters, 9.5 is the ideal diameter for, uh, for lower GI endoscopy. And as you know, the narrower the scope, then the, the smaller the biopsies are, and the narrower the, the, uh, the instrument channel, and the biopsy channel and the uh, smaller the biopsies, which we do not want. And for those of you who scope, you will see that it's easier to take biopsies from the large intestine. The tissue is much, it's much easier than the stomach or uh, the small intestine sometimes. Um, and there's an explanation for that and very, a very simple one because air is not entrapped in the, uh, the lumen uh, it gets away from the anus, then you have something like a deflation of the large intestine. So the tissue is much more flaccid to get bigger chunks of biopsies. So we definitely need a four-way tip deflection, up, down, right, and left, of at least 180 degrees def uh, deflection. And uh, most of the endoscopes have uh, 210 um, like the ones that we do gastroscopy as well. And they have to be fully immersible and also for colonoscopy, but only for the descending colon and for the anus, uh, for the rectum and the anus, we can use the rigid uh, scope, um, but only if we are certain that we have uh, a very, very specific lesion that's restricted in this area. And to be honest, you never know that. So you, you, in order to perform the whole uh, lower GI endoscopy, I would prefer to, um, to, to, to do it with a flexible one, um, because you can, you will be able to see the transverse colon, the ascending colon, the the, the, the cica and the ileum, um, with, with which with the rigid scope you do not have access to. The rigid scope are, is only for very, as I said, um, localized lesions in the rectum, in the rectoanal region. Um, and also sometimes we really want to take bigger uh, chunks of biopsy and we can do it sideways with a rigid scope if the lesion is a polyp, a polypoid mass or um, another kind of lesion like adenocarcinoma that's located in this uh, region, in the rectoanal region. And in terms of accessories, they are pretty much the same accessories. If you have any questions, because I want us to discuss, for those of you especially who have uh, some experience and solve all your questions, we can have a, a discussion as well. Um, the endoscopic accessories are the same accessories that we have in gastroscopy. So we have our biopsy forceps, okay? And uh, there are many multiple kinds of um, biopsy forceps, the round or ovile with uh, the ellipsoid cups, the smooth edge, the alligator ones, the rat tooth, the non-fenestrated versus the fenestrated ones with or without the spike. I hate this category and I will uh, erase it from my presentations either. I do not want you to have a spike in your uh, biopsies uh, because you ruin your samples. Uh, rotatable ones, the uh, swing jaw, uh, which have a, a deeper bite and the disposable or reusable. Um, it has been proven that with the uh, reusable ones, you for, for 10 at least endoscopies, you can take very well, very good quality uh, samples. Um, and my preferation, you can choose whichever biopsy forceps you are more familiar with, but my uh, personal preferations, and we're going to talk today a lot about personal preparations, is the ellipsoid one and the fenestrated one because it doesn't squeeze uh, your sample and you have 
more representative uh, samples. Other accessories used in uh, colonoscopy are the cytology brush. Uh, we, I actually use cytology brush in the large intestine um, only for research reasons, um, not for maybe if I have a cancer, a neoplastic lesion, and I want a quick, uh, a diff quick uh, slide, uh, I can use my I can use my brush and have a quick result so that I can tell the prognosis before the biopsy before the result of the biopsy. These are the reasons that we can use the the brush um, because even for culture, I said tissue culture and not uh, a culture from the from the brush. Um, also, you see these uh, endoscopic forceps here that are attached to an endoscopic electrocautery. Our endoscopic electrocautery uh, is uh, different than the um, surgical ones. I would advise you not to use the surgical ones because they are very, very potent and you might cause um, problems to the like uh, lesions, uh, ch chemical and uh, electrocautery lesions to, your, uh, to the mucosa of the large intestine. And this is attached to your electrocautery in order, for example, to uh, excise. Uh, this is a polypectomy snare in order, in order to excise polyp. Um, endoscopic irrigation pumps. Uh, I was very, very happy to see that uh, we have the uh, adapter now uh, so that we all can use the uh, irrigation uh, pumps. They're very useful in the uh, large intestine because if you have not cleaned your um, intestine very well, which is not preferable. Um, you can clean it with your uh, irrigation pump and you can have better vis visualization of the mucosa. Uh, some balloon dilators, uh, like the ones that we use for esophagus, we use it also for colonic strictures. And there was a recent uh, article of Valérie Fraise uh, about uh, colonic um, uh, colonic stric stric strictures, localized colonic strictures in cats, uh, and we were missing these uh, cases. So it's always good to have balloon uh, dilators for these cases. Um, injection and aspiration uh, needles, these are for fine needle aspirations from neoplastic lesions or um, to inject in the strictures some uh, triamcinolone or cortisone in order to avoid restructuring. And I think that's pretty much with the um, with the rest of the accessories. Uh, this is also a colonic lavage pump. Uh, I, I, I'd rather use my, uh, this is for the, for having uh, enemas prior to your um, during the preparation period prior to your colonoscopy. And uh, um, I all, I, I, you can use your irrigation pump, but uh, in a sedated animal, this is also in an in a, a alert animal if you want to do your enemas more vigorously. So what are the indications for lower uh, GI endoscopy? Because... I see a lot of patients referred that have both, for example, um, small intestinal disease and large intestinal disease. What do I do with these patients? Do I do uh, colonoscopy? So I, I have, for example, uh, an animal that has mucoid diarrhea with blood, but I also have watery diarrhea and uh, normal defecation, uh, not increased frequency of defecation. So what do I do? Uh, do I do gastroscopy? Do I do colonoscopy? Most of the times we do both if we have mixed uh, symptoms from, from both small and large intestine. And which one do I do first? We preferably do first uh, your gastroscopy at the same time. Um, and then uh, the colonoscopy, because this is a dirty procedure, the colonoscopy. So we prefer to do it after we have performed our uh, gastroscopy. Okay. So the indications are diarrhea with increased frequency, tenesmus, like the dog here uh, in the photograph, uh, dyskasia, um, hematochesia, when we have increased fecal uh, mucus, uh, constipation, obstipation, 
occasionally, not all of the times, if we have, for example, because most of the, sometimes this is a dysmotility disorder of the large intestine and endoscopy will not show you anything. But if you have a stricture, for example, it would be great if you could do your barium uh, first uh, in the large intestine and then uh, a few days later, two days later, go for your colonoscopic procedure. Um, and of course, the, ileo the ileoscopy uh, has the indications of the small intestinal diseases like vomiting, weight loss, uh, small bowel diarrhea. And as I told you, especially if we have low cabal cabalamin, ileoscopy is uh, requested. Yeah, you cannot avoid it. And the pathology under the diseases under chronic large intestinal uh, diarrhea, because most of our patients are not the patients that have acute large intestinal diarrhea, acute colitis. The patients that uh, will be referred for you to scope are the patients that have chronic uh, large bowel uh, diarrhea. And of course, it could be idiopathic, could be lymphoplasmacytic, uh, inflammatory bowel disease. Um, we, I have this in green because we always have to differentiate it from the acute um, hemorrhagic uh, enteritis, the uh, uh, Clostridium uh, perfigens enterotoxicosis syndrome. This is not something that uh, needs to be uh, scoped uh, with a lower GI uh, endoscopy procedure. So we always have to have to keep that in mind. This is an acute event. Okay, um, even though a lot of uh, owners are very, very displeased and very worried and they want the colonoscopy because they see large amounts of uh, blood, uh, this is hardly ever needed in this situation. Okay, uh, malignant uh, neoplasias like adrenocarcinoma, lymphosarcoma, and we're going to go into all the neoplastic lesions later. Piogranulomatous colitis. Um, you can have also uh, granulomatous colitis in uh, animals that you priorly had a foreign body going through the uh, large intestine that was expelled with a feces, but left a lesion there. And this uh, granuloma tissue can cause stenosis, uh, can cause constipation. Uh, so beware of this uh category as well. Istiocytic ulcerative colitis, especially in boxer dogs, in Bouvier de Flandre, in, uh, in a lot of breeds uh, now, and, and also in uh, any breed it can be presented, but boxers are over-presented. Um, eosinophilic uh, colitis as well, uh, parasitic induced by trichuris, by giardia, or a dietary induced and food allergy. If you have a very young animal, you always have to take a very good clinical history. If you have a very young animal, you're not going to expect, you know, to have lymphoplasmacytic uh, infl inflammatory uh, large bowel disease. You're going to see about istiocytic ulcerative uh, colitis if the if the breed fits or any any way you're you're going to scope and take your biopsies, and also. Um, exclude parasitic diseases and food allergies that can cause uh, these symptoms. Uh, Isoplasmosis in the places where this is endemic. And we always have to keep in mind the secondary uh, colitis, uh, which can be caused by systemic diseases like acute pancreatitis, like uh, uh, uremic um, diseases, uh, antimicrobial, any, any um, systemic disease. And I'm not talking about Addison's disease because Addison's disease causes more small intestinal uh, diarrhea, but it could also uh, be presented with uh, large bowel uh, symptoms as well. So first we do our blood work, our uh, CBC and biochemical profile, we exclude all the extra intestinal diseases, and then we, we go into, we proceed into doing our endoscopic procedures. What about now the patient preparation? And um, having said about the patient preparation, this is the, the, the actual part that most of you are missing. Um, you're very uh, competent and very good in performing the endoscopic procedure per se, but we tend to perform an endoscopic procedure in an intestine that looks like uh, the picture in A. You cannot perform 
an endoscopic procedure in a picture that looks like A. You, you have to have a very, very good preparation and um, have a picture like B, or at least you will see in many of my procedures, we cannot achieve um, uh, this uh, kind of cleansing of, of intestinal cleansing, but you have to have um, at least 85% uh, of, the, of the picture B, uh, a, a cleaning effect, uh, a result, uh, at least at, uh, at an amount of 85%. Um, as we said before, we do uh, we take a complete history, full physical examination, blood work, plain radiographs, and ultrasound examination. And the colonic preparation can be either done with oral lavages or with enemas. I will tell you both. I actually combine both techniques in order to have a good result. It's imperative to have general anesthesia and intubation. Uh, we will talk about the patient positioning. And as I told you, gastroscopy is always performed first if we want to do both procedures. And I want to say here, because I really want you to do to perform prior to any dog that has large intestinal symptoms, I really want you to perform a digital rectal examination. It's even more important and even more crucial than the fecal cultures that a lot of you, uh, a lot of us uh, perform. Fecal cultures have no um, utility in veterinary medicine. And we had a very, very good journal club with Stefan Unter about uh, fecal cultures and their significance in uh, veterinary medicine. Uh, those of you who did not attend it uh, may go to the to MEABC website um, and see their recordings and watch their recordings. So what can we detect with the digital examination? Identify if there is melina, if there is any diarrhea, uh, collect a sample of stools to do parasitologic examination, uh, also uh, scrapings to, to do a cytology, a fecal cytology, um, to actually detect if there is absence of stools and maybe, you know, get suspicious about an obstruction uh, higher up in the intestinal uh, tract, to also see prolapse uh, and uh, intussusception, and also to uh, to detect perianal hernia. And I know that a lot of you say, oh, hernias can be, you know, visualized by the external uh, visualization just by seeing them. And I tell you that they cannot. When they're in, the, in their early beginning, very, very slight herniations can cause constipations and tinesmus. And this is not... These are not cases that should be actually scoped. These are cases that you can detect if you do a digital, a very thorough digital examination in both sides, and you can detect the difference in both sides. And of course, to see uh, the annual uh, pharyngulosis as well from the inside, not from the outside. Now I'm going to talk about colonic preparation the hard way. And then I'm going to talk about colonic preparation, my way, which is an easier way. Um, and of course, it's not my way. It's a way that I was also taught in different universities just to make our life uh, easier uh, and the, uh, the life of the owners easier. Because in textbooks, um, this preparation is that's you know described is very good, but it's hardly ever done Um in humans, in order to have a, a colonoscopy, a lower GI endoscopy, you have to have a preparation of three days of fasting and uh, getting, uh, you know, a clean prep or all oral uh, lavage solutions. Um, and it's difficult. People have to, you know, stay out of work because they have to be near uh, the toilet all the time. Um, let's see what's described for, for dogs and cats. And I will tell you what I do. So uh, it's imperative to withhold food for 24 to 48 hours prior uh, colonoscopy. So if you are certain that the owners will not go, uh, will not comply with your 
uh, rules with the colonoscopy rules, keep these animals in your clinic. Uh, otherwise, you will have a dirty large intestine and everyone will be very, very disappointed. So 12 hours prior to the, to the procedure, uh, they, the owner brings you the uh, animal to your hospital, to your clinic, and you can place an orogastric or a nasopharyngeal uh, tube. Nasopharyngeal uh, tubes uh, works better for cats. Cats do not tolerate orogastric tubes. Uh, for the administration of the lavage so solutions, um, this can be without sedation in very, very calm animals, but in animals that um, that are not calm, sedation, slight sedation will be needed. And um, I urge you to be really, really careful about your nasogastric tubes, uh, nasoesophageal tubes, uh, because they, they have to be placed uh, and secured by a radiograph whenever we take uh, whenever we uh, place uh, an esophageal tube, then we definitely take a radiograph in order, in order to secure the correct, the correct placement. Otherwise, we might have aspiration pneumonia. And once the placement is confirmed, then we can give a high volume of colonic lavage uh, solution. Um, most of the solutions are polyethylene glycol, uh, two to four dosages of 25 to 30 mLs per kilo over two hours. Um, in many textbooks, uh, you will see some uh, dosages, especially in dogs, that 25 mL per kilo are kept for cats, but um, you might see 60 mL per kilo, for example, uh, the dosages for dogs. I prefer to go lower. And uh, alternatively, some people prefer the entire, the entire volume to be uh, delivered as a constant uh, infusion via a nasoesophageal tube over six to eight hours. But this means that you have to keep these animals, these patients uh, in clinic, in house, okay? Um, let's see, the, these, this is how you measure your uh, for the tube, for, for the orogastric tube, most of the large breed dogs are really, really calm and they tolerate uh, the, uh, the orogastric route. These are the oral lavage solution in the market that we use, like the Clean Prep or uh, the Gully, the Gully Telly or the Golite. Uh, I use Clean Prep most of the time. I don't know what exists in your countries but it should be a polyethylene uh, glycol uh, solution. I use clean prep because I will tell you why I use clean prep. Um, after I tell you about the enemas. The enemas now are cheaper, but the uh, quality, if you only use enemas and not the oral route to, uh, to do the oral, uh, to, to administer the oral lavage solutions, then you will not have a... Uh, a, clean, a proper cleansing of the large intestine. Um, and it's definitely inadequate if ileoscopy is uh, planned. Um, we never use irritant uh, solutions like soap, bisacadyl or phos phosphate. And please be um, aware of phosphate enemas, especially in cats, because you, can, you may cause hyperphosphatemia and hyperphosphatemia can cause hemolysis after that. Okay, hemolytic anemia. Um, in large breed dogs, we can use two liters of warm water anemas. In medium sized dogs, one liter. The average, if you wanted uh, a ml per kilo, I use 20 uh, to uh, 50 ml per kilo um, with water anemas. Do not administer them very quickly because they tend to vomit. Okay, uh, with a folate catheter or with the Higgison um, pump. And I tend to use these sacks uh, or you can take a normal saline sack. Okay, you can cut it on, on the roof. You can just put some warm water. It doesn't have to be normal saline, some warm water. And you still have the extension that we put IV. And you adjust to this extension a folate catheter, and you go out in your you know ground area of your clinic with a nurse, 
and the nurse is uh, holding the, uh, no, the, the, the the bag with the saline or the warm water and the extension in the Foley catheter and another assistant is holding the dog. Um, and once you administer that, because the Foley catheter can get in really deep and you can have a deeper enema that way. Okay, um, then you just leave the animal to defecate. And if you do that um, every two hours or three hours, uh, then you will have a very, very good uh, effect of uh, cleaning your large intestine. And my easy protocol now. So I combine both oral lavages and enemas. And three days prior colonoscopy, we stop the feeding. And what we give as a meal is a soup of clean prep, 20 ml per kilo, diluted in warm water or warm milk, some animals better like the milk and one or two tablespoons of low fat canned diet of uh, um, a prescription diet of a clinical low fat diet. Okay, canned. Now, the one or two tablespoons are for large breed dogs. If you have a Jack Russell, you will put one to two, um, uh, not the big tablespoons, but the uh, the, the spoons of, of that that we use, you know, for the, the smaller sized uh, spoons. And um, this is just for flavor. So it's not a dosage that might restrict you in your mind. And it's not something imperative. It's just for the flavor so that the, the dog, most of the dogs, if you give them warm, uh, warm water with clean prep and uh, diluted uh, in low fat can diet, they are so hungry that they will drink the whole uh, solution. And even if they don't drink it, the you can give it, you know, with a uh, with a syringe with a 60 ml uh, syringe, it's easy for the owners, because these dogs are hungry if you keep them fasted for uh, two or three days. So we do that three times per day, uh, for three days. So they have three meals per day, three of these soups, um, three for, for three consequent days. Of course, you have to warn the owners that these dogs, I'm not talking about cats. This is very difficult uh, in cats. But some cats tend to consume this soup as well. Um, but you have to inform the owners that these dogs will need more regular walks out because they will defecate more often. And once the owners in their home, in their house do this protocol, then 12 hours prior colonoscopy, they bring them to the clinic and we do the enemas as I, as I told you with the nurses and with the extension of the normal uh, saline bag and the folate catheter uh, in the clinic. And we do one of these enemas, okay. Um, and then, we either keep the animal and we can have two or three of these enemas at 12 hours, eight hours or four hours prior the sedation. And right after the sedation and the intubation, I will show you, we, we, do, we perform uh, a deeper enema with warm water and we also take a radiograph in order to ensure that we don't have uh, any more feces in the intestine. Uh, but of course, you know, you ask your nurses and they tell you what kind of material uh, the dog defecates. I know that we spent a lot of time in that, but this is very, very important. Otherwise you will not end up uh, performing your colonoscopy. So this is after the sedation, the dog is intubated. You're going to see that in a bigger picture uh, later. Uh, it's not just the propofol here. Uh, the dog is intubated and we perform, you see that I have a towel on my feet and a bucket um, and I have this uh, diapers so that we are not, you know, we don't do uh, a huge mess. And we have warm water with these catheters that, that are actually inserted uh, all the way in the intestine. Beware, because you might cause, these have to be really, really soft catheters, soft rubber ca catheters. And even if they are soft, sometimes you can cause some lesions in the intestine. So beware when you get into the intestine, in the large intestine, and see very um, recent lesions 
you will know that these are from your catheter, okay? Not all, all of the times, but I just want you to be aware of that. So we insert that and we do that multiple times, two or three times up until clean water is coming out of the dog. And then we are secured that we have cleaned um, very well the, uh, the large intestine. Now, let's see what the books say about patient positioning. Uh, for rigid colonoscopy, we use most of the times right, uh, right lateral uh, recumbency because this permits uh, the colon to drain to the right, to the ascending colon and leave um, all the descending colon uh, with a good view, unobscured. Uh, for flexible in, uh, colonoscopy, most of the endoscopists use left lateral recumbency because the ileocolvic uh, valve is not obscured. And uh, sometimes we will turn the, uh, the patient from right to left, uh, especially when we enter the transverse column, because you will find that the most of, of, uh, of the residents and uh, the trainees say, okay, colonoscopy is easy because you only have one tube. It's not like the gastroscopy that you have to pass the, uh, the, pyloric, the pylorus. But you will find the more red outs in colonoscopy because we have these um, uh, folds. Uh, you, I, will, I will go, we will get through the splenic and the hepatic uh, turns that make it very difficult to turn. So sometimes you have to turn the whole animal in order from right to left in order to enter the transfer uh, colon, uh, transverse colon, and uh, the liquid then drains uh, away from your endoscopic tip and you have better tunnel visualization. Even having said that we use left lateral recumbency, I tend to use all my colonoscopies in sternal recumbency. I find it easier. Um, and I tend to, uh, to, to, to do them sternal, in sternal recumbency. Um, you might try it and you might find it, you know, more uh, convenient and more easy for you, but that's the easier way for me. Okay, my, the anesthesiologist is on the head of the animal and the animal is intubated, as I told you. We have our diapers, we have our bucket. Now the bucket is removed after we did the cleansing. And our scope is positioned just right on my right hand always. Okay. My monitor, I mean. And I hold my, my uh, scope with my left hand always. So now you see the animal is intubated. My assistant is on my left, always ready to take biopsy uh, samples. Okay. And I tend, as I told you, to do it on sternal recumbency. If you uh, perform colonoscopies, uh, just write on the chat box, what do you prefer uh, best? When we insert the scope in the rectum, we have to have an assistant who will bear with us the whole procedure. And most of the assistants change turns because you know they, they get really tired to hold the perianal tissue tightly because otherwise the, all the insufflated air tends to escape. So we will not open the lumen of the large intestine and you will not hold it at, as here shown in the picture, take a gauze, because after holding it with your fingers tightly, you will cause an hematoma to the poor uh, animal there, to the anus of the poor animal. Okay, so use a gauze and try to be gentle, but try to be firm so that the air is not escaping. And this is a very, very, you know, good tip because a lot of people tell me, I go into the uh, rectum and I do not see anything. I have to proceed into the descending column uh, in order to, try to, to have some air and have a view. Uh, this is a tip. Okay, just hold it. It will make you feel a bit of a constraint in your movements with the scope, uh, but you will get used to it and you will handle it uh, over time. Let's talk about uh, the normal anatomy for uh, a moment. So we have the anus, the rectum, the descending colon, and the transverse colon that goes from left to right. Okay, 
Uh, and we have the two lectures that we really have to, uh, to look uh, thoroughly because this is where we find uh, the most difficulties into turning. Um, and you might spend, you know, like 20 minutes and you will ask yourself, why can I not turn? I mean, I, I, I'm seeing where I have to turn. I see that I have to go right, for example, and I cannot turn my scope. Okay, the first one is the splenic flexure, and the second one is the apatic flexure. Uh, these are the transitional flexures from the descending to the transverse colon and from the transverse to the ascending colon. And um, I will share some tips for these two uh, flexures, how to do it. So one tip, as we already said, is to turn the animal from right to left, which is a bit difficult. It's a bit tricky when you have the animal positioned. Uh, and if it's a large red dog, it's a bit difficult, you know, to do maneuvers. Uh, and if you have the animal intubated as well. So we will talk about other things that we can do. You see that we also have the, uh, the cecum uh, and the il iliocolic valve and the ileum. We definitely have to pass the iliocolic valve. Okay, we when we did the first um, webinar on the introduction on gastroscopy, I don't recall having said so many things about the red doubt because it wasn't, you know, mandatory. Here it is mandatory because you're gonna have a lot of the times you will not know where you are. Um, you will lose your orientation. And especially if you're in the cat, the splenic and hepatic flexure are not that prominent. So you will not know, uh, am I now in the uh, descending column, in the transverse column, in the ascending column? And you have to know in order to, um, to know where you're taking your biopsies from. Okay. So never advance without direct visualization. This this is a rule number one in any endoscopic procedure. You do not proceed. The only, the only part that you proceed without seeing is when you're in the pylorus and you see all the intestine coming up onto you, which is the red doubt of the upper GI endoscopy. And you just leave it for a few seconds, you know, in order not to get out of the pylorus. But in the large intestine, you always visualize and then See, so the rule is centralize, insufflate, advance. Centralize, insufflate, advance. And this is what we call, in this picture, this is what we call a tunnel view. When you have a tunnel view is that you see ahead of you the large intestine. And you cannot do that in all the length of the large intestine. Okay, how is the red out produced? When your scope is attached on to the mucosa, okay, and the vision is lost. This is a red doubt. And how do I correct it? I go a bit further back. So I withdraw gently and slightly. I insufflate so that I can orient. And then I deflect the tip of my scope to the darker uh, region. The darkest region, your region, your darkest region might be a region, for example, upright in your uh, in your uh, vision uh, spectrum. So this is where you're going to look, where my dark region is so that I can deflect the tip of my scope. Okay, if you have any questions. Another thing that's very, very common in the large intestine is the slide, and we use it very, very commonly in the large intestine, uh, is the slide by technique. What is the slide by technique? So this is the technique actually that helps us. This is the tip that I was talking to you about. This is the technique that helps us move around these two flexures, the splenic and the hepatic flexure. So um, when, when you're doing the slide by technique, you are definitely going to have artifact uh, artifactual lesions, like the ones that I've told you that we will have with the catheter when we're cleansing, but you have to ignore these lesions and you have to know that you are the one who produced these artifact lesions, okay? So the let's say that we have the uh, our scope and we have uh, the, the lumen of the intestine, the, the scope approaches the flexure, which is the turning point 
Okay, and this is the, the, the moment that you will have your first red out. So the tip is slightly advanced with torquing movements, with torquing movements, and you let the mucosa slide up onto you. You see the movement of the mucosa coming onto your tip. Um, and then this is this is how the red out is produced. And then you you deflect your tip, and I'm talking about the large intestine now, dorsally, as uh, we do here in the second. Uh, picture. Okay, you deflect it dorsally, and then again, you slide with torquing movements. Okay, and your lumen will not be visible for a couple of centimeters, two to four, they say in the textbooks, but it's not, you know, uh, something to be measured. But for the next uh, four upcoming centimeters, you will lose the vision. And then the mucosa will slide up onto you. And then if you advance, you will have passed the flexure. So you need torquing, which is this movement. Okay. And sliding onto the mucosa, you will scoop uh, and you will definitely uh, produce lesions this way. But there's no other way uh, to, to escape the uh, these two flexures. Another technique is to move your body in order to move your flexures, not to torque, but to move your wrist. And we will explain that better uh, to, the, to those who will attend a workshop in uh, lower GI endoscopy, to move your whole body right and left in order to, um, to produce this 90 degrees of tip deflection that we need. These are the RT uh, factual lesions that we might cause. These are the straight lines caused by the scooping of the, by the slide by technique. And these are from suction. This is the, the circular, very, very well-defined circular ones are from your suction, okay? And seeing those, you should be aware that you caused them and that they're not uh, underlying large bowel pathology. Okay, let's talk about flexures. So uh, this is the first uh, flexure, the splenic one, and you see that as a fold. Okay, um, this is in a cat, the A, and this is in a dog. And in cats, both of the flexures, not only the hepatic flexure, the splenic one as well, are not that prominent, okay? But you know that you transition from the descending to transverse colon because you will endure, you will find a wall, you will endure difficulty into proceeding with a tunnel view. You will hit a wall and you will have uh, to deflect the tip of your scope. This is how you understand in order to orientate yourself in the large intestine. So the, the negotiation, as I said, of the colonic flexures is not that easy. It seems very easy, but it's not that easy. Uh, the first, first flexure is splenic um, between the descending and the transverse colon. And you have to both deflect the tip 90 degrees to the right and also rotate deflect and rotate and torque at the same time in order to get away from this flexure. And the second flexure is the hepatic uh, flexure. And this is also um, uh, uh, passed by continuing right rotation, always right rotation, right rotation, and maybe turning your wrist a bit, okay, sometimes. Let's see about what are the normal findings in the large intestine. So the normal colonic mucosa is pink, smooth, and glistening, like the ones that we've seen in the previous pictures. In the large intestine, uh, on the contrary uh, to, the, to the small uh, intestine, the submucosal vessels are always seen. They're very prominent, okay? 
Sometimes we can see lymphoid follicles, and I will show you in a picture later and in some scopes that we have in, a, in some endoscopic procedures. Some lymphoid follicles are present in the rectum and the, uh, the cecum. A uh, small amount of liquid like this one uh, from fecal material or from your uh, lavage solution can be present within the lumen. Um, when it's present, you have to uh, use your suction. I hate to use suction for materials like that because this makes my scope really dirty. But if you have it, uh, then you can't do anything else. Or, or put a folic catheter if it's, you know, uh, if it's in the descending column, the rectum, um, to take it out with a folic catheter and not with your scope. Um, the large intestine is always examined uh, when we we reach up to the ileocolic valve and then when we re when we withdraw uh, the scope, it's easier examined because we already have uh, insufflated air, uh, the lumen is open, and this is when we get biopsies on our way out. The same is with small intestine. I always take, we can inspect it going in, but we always take biopsies and we re-inspect it going out, okay, while we're withdrawing. The ileocolic valve always looks like a mushroom, very tightly closed. It's hardly ever I remember that it's open. Um, sometimes it's covered by bile and stained material. So this is the ileocolic sphincter or the ileocolic valve and the cecocolic uh, sphincter, which is always open and wide, okay, and uh, we go to the cecum. So we intubate both the ileum and the cecum in order to um, finish and to say that we have performed uh, a complete lower GI endoscopic procedure. And as you see uh, on the right picture, uh, you can see the normal mucosa with the vessels really prominent. Okay. The rectum now, you recall that I told you that it's very um, difficult when you enter uh, with your scope in the uh, rectoanal region uh, to have visualization because all the air escapes. So you put your assistant to hold uh, the, the anal folds uh, so that you avoid the air to be escaping. But another way, which I rarely perform, I only do, do that in very large breed, um, in large breed or giant breed dogs, is to retroflex your scope as we do in the J maneuver. Okay, you proceed your scope uh, a few centimeters, 10 centimeters, for example, 10, 15 centimeters, and you can re retroflex your scope. Uh, um, in order to see the lesions that you might have in the rectoanal region. Uh, it gives you a very good visualization if you have uh, a neoplastic lesion there or a polyp or uh, a lesion that's more flat um, and uh, more to, of the, to, to, to the wall of the, of the mucosa, uh, extending to the, to the wall of the mucosa, to the mucosal large intestinal wall. But um, I wouldn't suggest taking biopsies retroflexed in the, in the rectum and watch out for your scope as well. Uh, and in order to take it out, it's only obvious that you have to uh, make it straight again. Okay. That's another way. And last but not least, I want to talk about the paradoxical motion uh, because this is really, really common in the large intestine. And what is the paradoxical motion? We tend to see it more in the right colonic flexure. So uh, what is the paradoxical movement? You see that the more, first you have the difficulty into navigating the flexures. And then when you try to navigate the flexures and you do all the torquing and uh, maybe the turning of the animal right, uh, right to left and all these things. Then another thing is the paradoxical movement of the large intestine, which pushes you away. You try to insert the scope and you see that the flexure, instead of uh, approaching the flexure, you're going um, away from the flexure. You're going more distantly uh, from the flexure. And this is because due to the air, the colon is stretched 
Okay, so what I can do to fix that is to go a bit further to withdraw a bit. Um, suction, use my suction so that I can take all the air out, um, deflate the column, and then force the tip onwards again. This is the only way. It's like, imagine when you have a loop in the stomach. What you do is that you uh, deflate the stomach, you take it a bit further, you withdraw it, and then you insert the tip. This is the same thing. Otherwise, you will never be able to, if you have this paradoxical movement, you will never be able to reach the, the flexure. The further you insert, the, the, the more away the flexure uh, will go. Okay. And let's have a view of a colonoscopy. So you see these dots that you're seeing are the rectal follicles, the follicles, all these dots that you're seeing here. This is not pathological. This is not something pathological. In this animal, they're more prominent. Okay. And here in this animal, of course, we have a lesion. We have a lesion here, but I want you to see that the rest of the colonoscopy is normal. We had a very focal lesion. Will a focal lesion uh, make us not do the whole colonoscopy procedure? No, you will take a full view of all the colon descending, ascending and everything. And you see now that as I get in, it's very difficult to have a full vis visualization. So now I, I say to my assistant to hold the fold so that I can have a better view of the uh, of the of the uh, lumen, and the lumen keeps you know uh, deflating in front of me. Now I have a better view of the of the colon. Here I have some lesions, which are neoplastic, and we took some biopsies. My uh, intestine is pretty much it's it's very well cleaned, as you see. I'm inspecting my colonoscopic procedures are taking more than my gastroscopic procedures most of the times because you might lose lesions if you don't see because because of this deflation of the uh, large intestine you might lose the lesions okay so I go all the way up and here's our first flexure okay and I have to turn and it doesn't turn, as you see. I have to do a lot of maneuvers in order to turn and pass the flexure. And maybe I have it in a second video, the turning. So it's not that easy. Even for experienced people, you have to do a lot of torquing, a lot of moving of your... Um, and now uh, I mind you that I am in sternal recumbency. I'm not in uh, right lateral uh, recumbency because I like it more. I pass the flexures easier. So now I tried to torque, as you saw for a moment, and turn and go do the slide technique. I'm still, I still haven't passed the flexure, as you see here. If you have any questions or if you have experienced similar difficulties, please tell me. And now this is the moment that we will have a red doubt. You saw the red doubt that I wasn't seeing where I'm going. This is the sliding technique now. I leave the all the um all the, the mucosa to come right up onto me. And I have tunnel view again here. And I'm trying to see where is my uh, black spot. My black spot is on the right and I'm trying. Externally, you don't see my body. I'm turning my whole body in, or, in order to find my tunnel view and my black spot view. And I seem to have straightened a bit the, the intestine now. Now it's easier and you will get into the, the flexure. Okay. And here, my cleansing is not that Good. As you see, I have a lot of material that has left. Let's go to the to the next one. I have a lot of material that has left, has been left, and I need to suction it, but I always hate suctioning it with my scope. And this is my cecum, okay? 
and this is my iliocolic valve. And you see that the iliocolic valve is covered by a bit of fecal mucus material, and it could be in this fold, could be hidden in this fold. This is why wh when you're on the left, when you have left lateral recumbency, the iliocolic valve will be better visualized. In my sternal recumbency, um, I know where my iliocolic valve is, so I go and I just turn uh, into the fold. But for you, you might find it easier, especially to reach the iliocolic valve, uh, to do it on left lateral recumbency because you see that it was hidden, both the cecum and the iliocolic valve, okay? And then on my way out, I try to take biopsies. And there are some biopsy techniques that we will talk about, um, the same ones as in the small intestine. The first biopsy technique is to go blindly and proceed your uh, biopsy forceps. And when it feels distended and curved, then you open and uh, deflate the colon so that you take a lot of uh, mucosa um, and maybe the submucosa and then uh, get a very good grip. Um, but I don't like this technique. I like the one that we, I'm gonna show you now, which I like best. So we definitely have to collect eight to 12 samples. We place the forceps always perpendicular, which means like vertical, like in these below pictures. Okay, 90 degrees of turning onto the mucosa because these are the best biopsies and we do not proceed our forceps very, um, very much. We keep it close to the scope so that we can have the control. Okay, always on the back of the peristaltic wave, we can have better biopsies. We suction so that all the air comes up to our open um, forceps and then we grasp. Let's see a cytology brush technique from a poor dog that has istiocytic colitis. This was a boxer dog as well. So I put my, this is single use, my brush. Okay, uh, these are single use, they're, they're not, you know, uh, you cannot use them again. And you're trying to put the brush on the mucosa and actually produce blood onto the mucosa. It's really, really, you really have to rub it. Uh, and then you take it in and take it, proceed it out of your uh, scope. Now, what are the abnormal findings? In inflammatory uh, diseases, we can have reduced, like the infiltrative large bowel diseases, we can have reduced visibility of the submucosal vessels. You cannot see the submucosal vessels because of the thickening of the mucosa. Increased irregularity and friability and granularity. So it's not even and smooth. The mucosa, it has lubs and puffs. Increased mucus, shallow erosions, that you have to differentiate from your artifacts lesions, okay? Nodularity, uh, spontaneous hemorrhage, and ulcers in the istiocytic uh, colitis. And let's have a look. This is a lymphoplasmacytic uh, large intestinal enteropathy, and this dog also was scoped, um, was gastroscoped. Okay, and it's upper, with upper GI endoscopy, and it also had infiltrate disease of the small intestine. So now this is the cica on, uh, as you see it on your left is the cica, on your right, the one that I'm intubating now is the iliocolic valve. Sometimes we're not able to intubate the iliocolic valve. So most of the times it's very difficult. Um, so what do we do? Uh, we either have our forceps as a guide, so as to help us, as a guide wire, so as to help us to uh, negotiate the iliocolic valve better. So you see now that I have opened it uh, with, my, um, with my forceps, 
okay? And then your scope can proceed. Or you can have blind biopsies from the ileum because we definitely need to have biopsies from the ileum, okay? And as you see, this is a two years old male dog uh, that had chronic large bowel diarrhea. You see the dots, as we said, the follicles, which are normal, as we said. And we didn't do a very, very good preparation. We actually did, but because we did the gastroscopy, a lot of material from the small intestine, from the air, came to the large intestine. And this is why you see so much of the content uh, now as well. And we have patchy areas of hyperemia, but we definitely need to go all the way up. And this is our flexure here again and the trouble of negotiate, negotiate. You can understand now the flexure. You see it as a fault, okay? And we have patches of hyperemia. The large intestine in this animal, and you see now that we, that we negotiated the flexure, we passed the flexure, okay? And we went from the transverse to the ascending column, and this is the cica on the left and the iliocolic valve on the right. Okay. And the first thing I do is I try to wash a bit. If it's very dirty in this area, you can wash your, you can use your irrigation pump, uh, the one that Auha uh, showed you in the beginning, or you can put a 60 ml syringe and wash a bit of the area because you're going to take biopsies and especially from the cecum uh, as well. You're going to take biopsies from this uh, area. So it's good to, to have clean biopsies. And I think that I'm proceeding either my biopsy forceps now. Yes in order to start taking uh, biopsies. First, you will enter the cecum and then you will start taking biopsies, okay? First, you will enter the cecum and then. And let's have a case. I know that you like cases. So we have Raki. Raki is a, a Greek uh, drink for, those of you who have visited Greece, it's a very, very strong drink. I don't drink anything, so I'm not of you know experienced in that field, but um it's a very it has a very, very strong odor and taste for those of you who are you know uh up for challenges. Uh so Raki was a boxer, female intact, one year old, and beware of these dogs that are very, very young. Never give corticosteroids in these dogs, okay. And we had a clinical history of chronic large bowel diarrhea, unresponsive to febendazole, to multiple dietary trials, and to metronidazole for four months. This poor dog had, had been uh, on uh, antibiotics intermittently for more than four months, okay? But the, um, the symptoms were not uh, resolved. So we had hematochesia, tenesmus, mucus uh, blood, increased frequency of defecation, large bowel uh, symptoms. Uh, and also we had regurgitation and vomiting uh, intermittently. The physical examination findings, bright and alert, uh, lip licking and hypersalivation, uh, the temperature normal, the heart rate normal, uh, the CRT was uh, more than uh, two seconds, was a bit increased. Uh, the respiratory rate normal and the body condition score was awful. She had lost a lot of weight um, and uh, the dehydration 10%. The rectal uh, palpation uh, painful uh, and we could, in the rectal palpation, we could actually palpate the regularity and the increased granularity of the uh, of the rectal uh, mucosa. So, ten days after 
she came for the physical uh, examination. We did a CBC and um, a biochemical profile. The CBC was pretty much, you know, normal. But the in the biochemical profile, in order to exclude all other uh, extra intestinal diseases, the total proteins were, uh, please, uh, doctor, whoever has a question, please uh, pose your question. If you want to, whoever raised your hand, pose your question in the chat box. Um, 10 days later, we did uh, a thorough investigation uh, and she had low total proteins. Both her albumins and her globulins were at the low uh, end, at the low uh, normal end. Okay. And her cholesterol levels were a bit lower than normal. When the cholesterol uh, levels are lower than normal, this indicates small intestinal, severe small intestinal disease, but it was okay. It was not, you know, it was low and normal, her cholesterol uh, levels fasted. The rest, baseline cortisol, amylase, lipase, everything normal. And due to her regurgitation and vomitings, uh, we wanted to see if she had some kind of uh, hypomotility disorder. So she did have, we did a barium, okay, throughout the whole intestine, um, both esophagus, stomach, small uh, and large intestine. And she had some esophageal dysmotility. You will see that um, some barium was kept in her esophagus, in, in her esophageal area. It was not mega esophagus, it was what we call functional mega esophagus, which is um, because you see in the next uh, x-ray, for example, this is missing. All the barium has gone to the stomach, but in the initial one, some barium was retained um, and it shouldn't have, neither this one. So functional mega esophagus uh, can, can be caused by various diseases, even by infiltrative uh, diseases. And sometimes in these animals uh, that have chronic vomiting, for example, we can have, or Addison's disease, we can have a functional mega esophagus. Um, and we saw that this dog had also delayed gastric emptying times. Okay. Let's see the colonoscopy. You will see a very, very nasty colonoscopy with a lot of ulcerated regions in the descending, in the descending, uh, sorry, uh, colon. You see that circumferentially we have this. This was this is a very painful disease, a very painful disease. Um, throughout the large intestine, we had a lot of ulcerated regions. And this is this blood, we did not cause it. We were not the cause of this blood. This is due to the disease per se. You see the ulcerations. And of course, we took biopsies from these uh, ulcerated uh, lesions. With the technique that I told you, we retroflex 90 degrees. Okay. And um, this pathology came out uh, past positive for macrophages. You need to be aware of the disease and also um, maybe get your histopathologist suspicious about the disease because he, he has to go with um, very specific uh, a characteristic. Uh, uh, th this is a past positive uh, technique that he has to use. Okay. Um, neutrophilic inflammation, necrosis, and of course, ulceration. Um, and FISH uh, technique detected the presence of attaching and invading uh, E. coli. And this is the only disease in the large intestine and actually in the small intestine that's curable. You can cure it, you can treat these animals. Uh, because we, we, before knowing this disease, that it was attributed to a bacterial uh, agent, we used to give, um, to treat them as IBD uh, diseases. And we 
we used to give these animals corticosteroids and we were killing these young boxers and brassicephaly breeds that had um, istiocytic ulcerative colitis. And the treatment is enrofloxacin, 10 milligrams per kilo every 12, uh, every, uh, sorry, uh, 24 hours for at least eight weeks. Um, and when you go and rescope these animals, the lesions are gone, the pathology is gone, and they're not going to have it again. They're not going to have a relapse again in their lives. But of course, do not give empirically antibiotics. I tend to use, nowadays, we see a lot of animals that have been, that have resistant, resistance even in enrofloxacin. So uh, please um, send tissue cultures. As you take your biopsy cultures, just put them in normal saline. Some samples put them in normal saline uh, and um Eppendorf, sterile Eppendorfs, okay, and sterile normal saline. You just open the small bottles of sterile normal saline um, and you put in an Eppendorf and then you put your biopsies in there um, in order to have a proper culture uh, and sensitivity test. And um, the antibiotic treatment, as we said, is, should all, always be guided by culture and sensitivity tests. And it is so painful that patients with chronic lesions may have rectal uh, strictures as well. So you might have to address that on a second uh, level. Um, it's very common in, um, in boxers, very common in uh, Bouvier de Flandre, in Mastiff, uh, in Huskies. Okay. Um, and some animals also respond to amoxicillin and uh, clavulinate. It has, there is a genetic component Okay, to all of this, but it's something that we can treat. It's something curable. What about neoplastic diseases of the large intestine? Uh, we can have benign, like polyps, lymiomas or adenomas, and malignant, which are more common than um, benign lesions. This is a malignant uh, adenocarcinoma, uh, lymphoma, lymphosarcoma, gastrointestinal stromal tumors, uh, extramedullary plasmastomas, which are really, really rare, and carcinoids. Um, this is a polyp at the clinic uh, that was actually excised not with a polypectomy snare in a German Shepherd dogs. German Shepherds are really overpresented. Um, this, was, this, this did not have uh, a base, a very narrow base. So it was, uh, it had a flat, distended base. And we were lucky because it was in the first uh, five to 10 centimeters where we can excise this polyp uh, by a technique called pull through. So we pull through all the uh, colon, uh, the colonic mucosa, and we excise uh, the, the polyp. And as you see, it was not protruding. So these lesions, these polyps, either, some owners say that they see something from the anus, but when the animal has a lot of uh, fare, um, they might miss it because here it was not protruding. And when we pulled the mucosa, it was shown the extent and uh, the, the base also, which is really, really crucial in order to decide, will I do... Um, an excision with a polypectomy snare uh, and my endoscopic cautery, or will I do the excision uh, surgically with a pull-through technique? And also, how deep uh, from the uh, from the rectum the the polyp is. So let's say that we found this polyp. Will I proceed into doing my colonoscopy? You will definitely do because you need to know if there are other uh, polypoid lesions. Uh, maybe if, a bit further up, and you need to address these lesions as well. This is another one. This is a Westie, seven years old. Most of these animals are uh, seven and more. Uh, you will see that this dog has a completely normal colonoscopy procedure, apart from the distal part of the colon, uh, the anal rectum uh, area where there is a poly, polypoid lesion and we excised it with a polypectomy snare and cautery. 
And this is a West Highland white. And why did I say that? Because Westies are also overpresented with benign uh, polypoid lesions. Okay. And this is the procedure I'm deflating a bit in order to see these, you see some, some small dots, which are not the follicles. This is um, hyperemia, and these are lesions actually in the, um, in the colon. So we definitely take biopsies, even if we don't see anything microscopically, but here we do have uh, these pinpoint hemorrhages which are not, this is this this line here is an artifact. It's us, it's our scope, okay? But all the other dotted are not. So we proceed further out from the flexures. Sometimes you might even see worms in the large intestine in especially if the uh, the owner is not deworming. And now on our way out, you will see a very small polyp with uh, a, a small base, not a broad base, that we can excise very, very easily with um, our endoscopic cautery. The rest of the mucosa, is normal, but we inspect the whole large intestine as we withdraw, as you, as you see, okay? And we inspect every inch of it circumferentially. And I think, yes, and this is our polypoid mass here at hour five, okay, at five o'clock. This is it here. And we will go in and strangulize it and cut it and cauterize it with um, our uh, endoscopic uh, cautery. This is a lymphoma in a German Shepherd dog. You see that it's protruding. And this is from my uh, professor. Dr. Riley's the, uh, the pictures, you see that it's really, really nasty and it's not localites. This is a more diffuse uh, disease. And this is uh, with different uh, illumination. And the new AUHA scopes also have this kind of illumination in order to enhance the lesions. And let's go and see an intestinal adenocarcinoma. that was localized in the uh, rectal anal region and a bit in the uh, descending column. And you will see in on the, on the left, the abnormal tissue here, the proliferating neoplastic tissue. It's different than the normal colonic tissue. You can see it. And we go in and try to take some biopsies. And here we have already, you will see a white crater uh, on the left of, the, of your uh, image. And this crater where I show you, this crater was when another uh, mass was protruding and we caught it with uh, a polypectomy snare. It was not polypoid mass though. This is a more broad base uh, lesion. And the tissue is so fragile that it comes out. You see this flat white uh, region. This is the region that we have cauterized with our endoscopic cautery because we have cut it it was a big lesion and we have cut it here as well. Uh, we have cut it with our endosurgery and now we're going into taking other samples as well. Um, 
could I have used my brush cytology? We could have used it for a quick result, you know, to know what it is. Um, but I did it in this uh, patient. Let's see here, for example. And it has to bleed. It has to bleed. You can detect the abnormal tissue. The abnormal tissue is proliferate, is abnormally proliferative. It's not like the rest of the colonic uh, mucosa. And here it's a sarcoma. You can see the tissue, the proliferating tissue as well. Same thing. The rest of the intestine was normal. You always perform, even if you see this proliferative uh, and changing color tissue, you see how bad it is. And it was really, really painful. This dog could not defecate properly. It has a dyskesia, a hematochesia, tinesmus, a lot of tinesmus, and you could palpate it. The, the, the referring vet was very smart into palpating that something wrong was in the intestine. And this last one is a very, very interesting one. Sometimes you go into the cecum and you see that tissue is protruding through the hole of the cecum. And you say, what is this? Is this some kind of a mass? of a neoplastic lesion, this is the, this is the ileocolic valve that's open and next to it, as you see, this is this bump there, like a mass, which is not a mass. It's the inversion of the sickle mucosa. Uh, this is a very rare case that you might, you know, encounter. Of course you will biopsy it. We biopsied it and it was normal cecum not normal, congested cecum um, mucosa. So you have to, to then uh, address it surgically. Otherwise, you will have a septic uh, problem. Okay, you see that it looks like a mass. And it was even hard, harder than the normal cecum uh, mucosa. Yet, it was a cecal inversion. And this is uh, ileoscopy. Uh, this is negotiating the uh, ileocolic valve. Okay, we always have to do that. And I will never stop uh, saying that because we really need biopsies from the uh, ileum. Okay, so even if I cannot intubate the ileum, you see that my forceps are preceded in the ileum. Can I cause a big trouble? Can I, for example, cause a rupture in the small intestine? Try to be gentle. Sometimes I proceed my forceps and then I go just to open it a bit. And then I go with my forceps on the tip and my scope. And you will see that I succeed to get in because I open my way as I open my way in the pylorus. This is a bit more difficult than the pyloric region. And here I am in the small intestine and you will see that the mucosa is totally different in the, uh, in the small intestine, okay? This is the small intestine now. So I intubated the ileum. And there are, especially as I told you in the cat, there are a lot of times that the problem is here in this region. That's pretty much everything. I don't know if there are any questions. You can follow us on Facebook, LinkedIn, in YouTube. Uh, we will have all uh, a lot of clinical cases that you can see. Um, and also the, the, the webinars, the recorded webinars at some point, they will be gradually uh, uploaded. If there are any questions, I will be more than happy to, uh, to answer. Yeah, please feel free to ask your questions to just put it in the Q&A boxes. 
Okay, let's see. Somebody has raised, some participants have, have raised hands, but I don't see any questions. Do, do you see? If uh, you have any questions and uh, we will not be able to answer them now, please don't, uh, don't hesitate to send me everything. Thank you so much for uh, attending. Yeah, thank and... you for brilliant presentation from Dr. Osliki. Okay, I don't think that people, people, this is a, uh, a procedure, uh, Jason, that people do not perform very commonly. Uh, so they have a lot of questions about gastroscopy because you do have questions when you also perform the procedure as well. Um, but I want you, I really want you, because of the, um, of the preparation, this is the, thank you, thank you, Didier, as well for, for, uh, for watching and stay with us till the end. Um, the preparation is a real hardship. And I, I hope that the protocol that I gave you will make it easier for you uh, to do the colonoscopies because, you know, you give it to the owner and they do it at home. So it's easier for you then to perform uh, colonoscopic procedures. Let's see another one. So I will see you next month with another uh, webinar on endoscopy. Thank you very much for your interest in veterinary science and in veterinary endoscopy. Um, and hopefully I will meet some of you tomorrow at the workshop in Malaysia. Yeah, uh, tomorrow my colleague Francis will uh, help to set up the workshop. And the, the workshop Good. will start. I will send you the case to... as well, Jason, yes. over the next days after yes. the Congress so that we can upload the case as yeah. well. Yeah, I think there's Thank you. Time. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Goodbye. Have a nice evening. Goodbye. Have a good rest. <laughs>